All right. So we have some kind of goal in mind for today, and I do hope I achieve it. Well, I opened yesterday's lecture by reviewing the story of Drinfeldstuckes. And I want to transport this story into the local setting to get some kind of space of Stuckas in the mixed characteristic world. That is, Stuckas for ZP. So I want to define some space of rank N Stuckas with some kind of co-character. And this should be fibered over something like spec QP. You see, I'm going to revise this notation later. It's not quite correct. But um, here's what we have to do to achieve this goal. Given some kind of base S, I want to tell you what the S points of this are. So the S points should classify some data. What data is that? So an S point of this should first classify legs, and legs should be maps from S to spec QP. But now everything has to be in quotes, because it will not literally be such a map. This will be our leg, and such a leg should determine um, inside of, again in quotes, S, well, I'll write it the other way, spec QP cross S, and there should be a diagonal inside of this. Sorry, not a diagonal. The graph of X should be such a thing. And then. There should be a vector bundle of rank n on this product. And then there should be a modification of vector bundles between the Frobenius pullback of E and E. So I'll call this F from Frobenius pullback with respect to S of E. I write a dotted arrow because it's a rational map. And this will be an isomorphism away from this diagonal. And furthermore, it should be bounded by mu, but I won't write that. So uh, here I've just written Stuckas with one leg, but you can imagine what happens with multiple legs. It would be then fibered over many copies of this space. So ultimately, this is the thing we have to do. The difficulty is we haven't said exactly what this product is, although we did get a taste of it yesterday, at least for um, s equaling something coming from an algebraically closed field. So um, along the way, we defined the faric fontaine curve. So let's just recall some of our definitions. Well, let's say C over QP is an algebraically closed complete field. I defined the y curve, before you mod up by Frobenius, you have this y. So this is the attic spectrum of the Witt vectors of OC. Take away the vanishing locus of these two elements, p and the class of p flat. What happened? Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and then this had a Frobenius acting on it. And I defined the quotient x ff. So the Farg fontaine curve is this. Um, right. So the first part of this lecture will have concerned vector bundles on this quotient. So um, on here, we want some kind of vector bundle, which will be phi equivariant. So what we discovered last time, if we define this ring B to be just the functions which are just the sections of the structure sheaf on this. This is some larger ring than a inf. It contains, for instance, this element t that I talked about last time, but it contains more elements than this even. Mm -hmm. So I just want to generalize what I, the construction I had last time <laughs> about this element t. Um, Uh, 
uh, there's an isomorphism. On the one hand, you have the elements of B where the Frobenius acts as P. So I constructed such an element last time. So today I just want to tell you exactly what this vector space is. Um, so I have to give you a QP vector space here because this is a, clearly a QP vector space. So I have to give you a QP vector space here and that's going to be All right, look at C tilt. Look at the maximal ideal of its ring of integers. And one plus this is a group under multiplication. But it's not just a group, it's a ZP module, because you can raise things to the power of an element of ZP. But it's not just a ZP module, it's a QP vector space, because you can divide by P. That would be taking a pth root, and C tilt is a perfect field, so this is totally fine. So this is a QP vector space. And this will be a QP vector space isomorphism. What is it? Well, if I'm given an element z here, so z is close to 1, I take its Teichmuller representative and I take its logarithm. And this will converge inside of b. And it will have the property that when you apply Frobenius to it, Well, Frobenius is continuous, so it's going to commute with this. But applying Frobenius to a Teichmuller representative just raises it to the piece power, and then, of course, you know how, this, you know how the rest works, right? Okay. okay. So this over here is an example of what's known as a um, Banach-Kolmez space. So this sort of thing appears as the global sections of vector bundles on the farg fontaine curve. So we can generalize this sort of thing as follows. I can construct a vector bundle on x by giving you a vector bundle on y and then giving you descent data. If I just let the vector bundle on y be trivial, the descent data comes in the form of an isocrystal. So let's just recall some notation here. An isocrystal. would be a pair n comma sigma n, where n is a vector space over, uh, well, I called the field k before. Um, yeah, that's fine. This is going to be w of, little k is the residue field of c. And then I invert p. Okay. And then I have an isomorphism from the Frobenius pullback to, to itself. Um, so isocrystals are classified If I wanted to classify isocrystals, I could say, well, write down a basis for n as a k vector space, and then tell me how sigma n acts on that basis. The result would be a matrix. So that matrix, I'll call it B. But then, of course, changing the basis changes what B is. And what it does to B is it changes it by something which is sigma conjugate. So I will say that B is equivalent to, let's say, G sigma B G inverse. This is the equivalence relation I want to mod out by. Um, this set has a name, it's called the Kotwitz set. And you can put whatever reductive group you like in here, and the outcome will be this set which classifies isocrystals with G structure. It's an invention of Kotwitz. And so this set is important because it will show up again, almost certainly, in the lectures of Farg and Schulze. And it's something to do with the classification of vector bundles on this curve. Um, back to this, so given such an isocrystal, um, maybe it's clear now how to construct a vector bundle on x. Uh, right. <coughs> of course, yeah. Question is, what was sigma? So, I mean, there's this confusion between sigma and phi, but they're the same thing. <laughs> so they both re represent kinds of Frobenius. And so, uh, I think I'm just respecting some traditions here, but 
we often write sigma to be the Frobenius on vit vectors. OK. All right. Uh, so pretty evidently, there's a functor. Um, there's a functor from isocrystals to vector bundles here. So how does this work? If I'm given an isocrystal, what I can do is simply let um, the corresponding vector bundle so this, what I've written down, is now a vector bundle on y of whatever rank n is. But now I want to descend to x, so descended through sigma n on the one hand and phi on the other hand. So phi acts on farg fontaine curve to descend down to x, and so you're just telling how this operator acts. Great. Um, as an example of this, I could let n simply be k. <laughs> and I can let sigma n act on a basis element as 1 over p. And this corresponds to some vector bundle on x. And I call this vector bundle a special name. Just call this O of 1. <laughs> just to su the notation suggests that it's some kind of ample line bundle on x. And actually, you can use this ample line, bu ample line bundle to create an algebraic version of the farg fontaine curve <laughs> by looking at global sections of tensor powers of this thing. It gives you a sort of projective embedding. And so in Farg and Fontaine's article, they also create a scheme version of this curve. But I won't get into this today. For now, I'll just say that the global sections of O of 1, if you just follow the definitions, that would be global sections of the structure sheaf on Y where Frobenius acts as p. That's exactly how I set this up. So this kind of um, banach comez space appears as the vector space of global sections of a vector bundle on the farg fontaine curve. So you can imagine what O of 2 and O of 3 and so forth are. But you can also have fractional slopes, which would correspond to isocrystals of higher dimension. You can have O of 1 half, 2 thirds, whatever. OK. Very good. Questions so far? Yes? Sorry, how does a 1 over p occur? Why is it 1 over p? Well, the global sections would be exactly where this acts trivially on, uh, on b. But if sigma n is acting by 1 over p, and I want that to act trivially. I mean, I, I'm, I'm asking that, yeah, I'm, a, I'm basically asking that on a, on a basis element, I want this to happen. And that's why it's phi of the element equals, well, uh, if E is the basis element, I guess the calculation goes like this. No, alpha times E. This is this kind of equation I'm solving. Then alpha ends up being when you apply phi to it, then p comes out. All right, All right very good. Um, so we have this functor. Is it an equivalence? Absolutely not. <laughs> there are many more morphisms in this category than there are in this category. Nonetheless, the major theorem of Farg Fontaine in their article, Introducing the Curve, is at least that. Every vector bundle here is isomorphic to something coming from the image. So uh, well, I'll just I guess I could just say the functor is what is the eraser? <laughs> Everyone sees it but me, I bet. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. Every f 
Yeah. Hmm. Well, if I call this E, then. Oh, I'm sorry. So YFF, the way I set it up, certainly it is. it lives over spa K. And this tensor product lies over K, and that's it. K is, K is all the way up there. <laughs> bit vectors of the. I've already inverted P. Yeah, everything lives over K in this story. QP in this story. X lives over QP, not over K. Yeah, every F is isomorphic to E of n for some pair n sigma n. But it's not an equivalence. I mean, you can see already over here that it's not, because I just said this has many, many elements. They all represent morphisms from O to O of 1. And almost none of them come from morphisms between isocrystals. OK. So we have this kind of um, enhancement of the category of isocrystals, which is, well, eventually that's going to be the stack of vector bundles on the farg fontaine curve which is the setting for the program of Farg and Schultz. All right. Um, very so good. The objects are the same, but the morphisms are not the same, right? The objects, well, you know, what would you say? It's essentially surjective. Like, everything here is isomorphic to the image of something here. But this category is much more complicated. <laughs> like, the morphisms are, well, the morphisms are very often uncountable dimensional vector spaces. <laughs> Those are these, these, these banach comes spaces. It's a bijection on isomorphism. That's what I'm yeah, saying here. It's a bijection on isomorphism classes. That's right. That's right. Uh, although I will say, if, if n is basic, so what does that mean? You know, these isocrystals, they're classified by slopes, like a list of rational numbers. But if all of those rational numbers are the same, we call n basic. And in that case, you do have something better. I can say that the automorphism group then on the level of automorphism groups, you do actually get the same group. And a particular example of this is that The automorphism group of Ox to the n, that vector bundle, the trivial vector bundle of rank n, is the group GLNQP. Okay. Very good. OK. So what do I have to say about vector bundles on this other than this? Well, I want to connect it to the larger story of Stuka's. Last time, I motivated the fact that a Stuka, a ZP Stuka with coefficients in OC, should be this gadget called uh, Broekis and Farg module. And so now I'm just announce a theorem about this. So um, I guess I switch these. So there's an equivalence of categories. On the one hand, you have the Broekis and Farr module. So that means a pair m comma phi m, where m is an a-inf module. For our purposes, this is going to be a free module of finite rank. And phi m is an isomorphism from m invert xi to m invert phi of xi. And uh, this is supposed to be phi linear isomorphism. 
Um, I feel like I can linearize it and say it's an isomorphism from the pullback, but then I would have to put phi of xi here. So we had this notion from before. This was our stand-in for the notion of a Stuka with coefficients in OC. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, well, maybe it's not so surprising because M is an a nth module and X is, where's X? X is derived from a nth in some way by quotienting out. So maybe it makes sense that you should descend this structure to the farg fenten curve. All right, so the second category will be vector bundles on the farg fenten curve with some additional structure. So the second category is triples, a T, an E, and a beta. And uh, the T is going to be a, a ZP module, free of finite rank. And the E will be a vector bundle on the far content curve. And the beta will be, okay, what have, what have I just written? So E is going to be a vector bundle on XFF, right? T is just a free ZP module of finite rank. So this object on the left is just a trivial vector bundle of some rank. Uh, these ranks, of course, have to be the same. And this is a comparison of the trivial vector bundle with E. They're isomorphic everywhere except for one point. So this is a modification of a trivial vector bundle, which produces a different vector bundle. Um, great. So this translates Broikis and Farg modules into the world of objects just living on this curve. Yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> OK. So yeah, that's, that's right. So the data here has to be. meromorphic at the point xc. And if you like, you can refine this by saying, well, if I bound, if I have a co-character mu corresponding to a sequence of integers, I can bound this module, and then the bound would just carry over to here. Yeah. And uh, other comments I have on this theorem. So t here is this atal realization of the Broikis and Farg module. It's what happens when you take m you base change the bit vectors of not OC, but just C tilt. And you take the phi m invariance of this. So this is certainly a ZP module, but you have to work to show that it's a ZP module of the same rank that m has over a inf. Mm -hmm. Is it like affine Grassmannian? Yeah, in fact, there's a, well, Everything is over just one geometric point, so there's nothing geometric happening right now. But there is an intermediate between these two, where you say, um, well, the completion of M at XC is going to be a B Durham plus module. <laughs> and the ways to do this modification is you're just picking a lattice, a B Durham plus lattice, inside of a B Durham vector space. And the moduli space of all of those is indeed a kind of affine Grassmannian. It's called the mix characteristic, or B. Durham plus affine Grassmannian. But I, I didn't write this here. Yeah, so already there's going to be a link to the world of geometric Langlands. Okay. Um, so I'm certainly not going to prove this theorem, but I thought I might give an example of it. Yes. Yes, I think if M were not free, then I, wouldn't, I couldn't guarantee that T was free, and then this wouldn't work. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, where's that hook? Oh, there it is. Well, no. <laughs> well, I told you how to get T. 
<laughs> but I, 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 I mean, instead of telling you exactly what the functor is, I thought I might give an example which demonstrates what's going on. Well, certainly if my m was just a nth and phi m was just phi, then I would get something very trivial happening over there. But I want something where the beta is actually not an isomorphism at xc, so I have to do something else. So I take a nth, and this is called the Tate twist by 1. So this is going to be a pair of phi for m phi m. So m is going to be free over a nth with basis vector just e. It's free of rank 1. And phi m e is going to be, well, I want this to be an isomorphism after inverting this element phi of psi, so I just do this. And I should review the definition of this psi. I want a particular one. Oh, I think I called it psi prime last time <laughs> on the suggestion of the audience. But anyway. Oh, that's confusing. I'm hoping drawing my psi is very different from my e's. Oh, there's an epsilon. Epsilon. Right. Oh, this is terrible. There's e's, epsilons, and psi's in this talk. I'll do my best to distinguish them. Okay. These are epsilons, and that's a psi. <laughs> so this epsilon is represented by a sequence of compatible piece power roots of 1. This lives inside of O, C, tilt. Therefore, its Teichmuller representative lives in A inf. And this element psi um, is well defined. And it, it, it generates this ideal xc. Um, OK, so I think it makes sense that this defines a perfectly good Broekus and Farg module. Um, what's the etal realization? So if I'm looking for an element in A inf, where phi acts by multiplication by phi of psi, uh, it is actually kind of evident how to do this because of the way I chose psi. I can just let t is going to be generated over zp by one element. So it's going to be oh, yes. I think I wanted to make things as clear as possible. I want to label. the basis vector of m as em. Okay. So if I look at this element and I hit it with phi m, <laughs> this divides by phi of psi, and then this does the same thing. <laughs> it's just in the opposite direction. So they, they cancel, right? If I hit this with phi, it becomes epsilon to the p minus 1, which is the same thing divided by phi of psi. Well, you know, you do the math. Okay. So this is the etal realization. So it's free of rank 1 over zp. All right, so that's one thing we know. Um, another thing is going to be the crystalline realization, and that's easy too. Remember, the crystalline realization is what you get when you quotient by the maximal ideal of OC. And in that world, psi just reduces to P. In the map from A and F to K. So in the map from A and F to K, psi just goes to P. And our isocrystal is just the isocrystal with slope minus 1. So I would write it this way. It's k e n, and then phi n of e n is just p inverse e n. Ah, all right. So we have our ital realization, and we have our crystalline realization. Now, last time I presented a picture of the Farg Fontaine curve, or, well, in fact, the y as living like along this kind of continuum. So I'm not going to draw this complete picture. But on this continuum, in the middle of it was xc. 
And then on one extreme, you had xc tilt. And on the other extreme, you had xk. And this, I would say, is the etal end. And this is the crystalline end. And on these two ends, we have mo on each end, we have a module with a phi action. Like on the crystalline side, we have the isocrystal n. And this gives you a phi module that lives here. But you can like extend it a little ways here. But you know, because phi is an automorphism, you can kind of extend and extend and extend as far as you want. But you can't include this point in it. Meanwhile, on the etal side, you have t. And you get a phi module that way too, but it's, the phi action is just trivial. And again, you can take that trivial module and just extend and extend and extend, but you can't quite extend to this point. But what's, what you can do is just have them meet in the middle. And that's going to give us this functor from 1 to 2, which I'm trying to explain now. So here's how this goes. I'll just take it in steps. Mm -hmm. All right, there are three steps. All right, I wrote down what T was. It has a basis element. So this is just a map of ZP modules. This is induced as a map. All right, so M here is a phi module over A nth. I can restrict it to the FARC fun, fun 10 curve Y. That just means I delete some points from SPA A nth. And this sends a basis element to multiplication by epsilon minus 1. Uh, very good. So this is like the trivial bundle. And this is our given structure m. But this is by no means an isomorphism. And the reason is that this has zeros. I mentioned this last time. This epsilon minus 1. It fails to be an isomorphism at the center point, and then all of these translates, the right translates of phi. So you get an isomorphism from M to the trivial bundle to the left side of XC. So I'll maybe indicate this by step one is over there. Two. <laughs> we also have um, isomorphism from M restricted to the Farc von 10 curve to to the phi module that you get just by base extending the isocrystal. So n was an isocrystal. It lives over k. The structure sheaf also lives over k. This tensor product makes sense. Um, this, oh, sorry, this, this is a map of phi modules. And this also is a map of phi modules. And what is the map? So it sends a basis vector to something, but everything has to work out and be compatible with the action of phi. And so there's really only one choice I can do here. I take our element t and divide it by epsilon minus 1. <laughs> so phi acted upon this by multiplying it by phi of xi, and phi acts on this by multiplying by 1 over by p. And this is exactly the quotient I need so that this commutes with the action of phi. Furthermore, I needed this to be t rather than some other element where phi acts as p, so as to cancel the zeros that this has. But t has its own zeros. t has zeros on every phi translate of xc both positive and negative, but dividing by this cancels them out to the left. So this only has zeros up. This only has zeros to the left of xc and none to the right. So this is an isomorphism over here. Hmm. 
there. And I'll just finish this over here. <laughs> the third step is to combine the first two steps. So if I just compose these two maps that I've written down, what do I get? I get a map O from a trivial vector bundle on Y to the vector bundle I get N tensor O Y. And what is it? Well, it's nothing but multiplication by T. Um, all right, and what properties does it have? Well, it commutes with the action of phi. That's fine, because both 1 and 2 do. But now um, it does the same thing at every translate of xc. It just has a 0 everywhere. OK. This 3 is what gives us the object labeled 2 all the way up there. You take this stuff and descend it to the Farrakh Fontan curve to below, XFF. So this was a map of phi modules defined on all of YFF, but it has zeros and just every translate of XC. So the result of descending this is you get a map from OXFF. OK, the descent of this was what I had called O of 1 before. And this is, I mean, I'll still label as multiplication by t. But it has a single 0 at, the, at this orbit. Uh, maybe I'm abusing notation here, but I'll call the same point xc, which lives down below. <laughs> All right, I think it's a marvelous theorem. So what happened was you had your Broy, Kiss, and Farg module. It had an Etal realization, which lives on this side. It has a crystalline realization, which lives on this side. You can identify the restriction of the Broy, Kiss, and Farg module to Y with one on one side and one on the other side and see how they meet in the middle. Then after descending, you get the sort of structure described in part two. OK. Questions? OK. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, really I don't, know, don't know if I'll ever finish this, but I'll try. <laughs> All right, I think I am to do, oh, yeah, I need the hook again. Nope. <laughs> All right, so we've now investigated ZP Stuckers. We've translated that into the world of Broy, Kiss, and Farg modules. And then we've translated further via this theorem to modifications of vector bundles on this curve x. And that is OK. Well, it defines these Stuckers with coefficients in an algebraically closed field, but it does not give you families of Stuckers. So to do that, we need to investigate the farg fontaine curve in some kind of relative setting, where the base is no longer C, but something else. So we've constructed this kind of product spa ZP cross spa OC. OC tilt, so this is supposed to be well, we've defined it as this. <coughs> but not yet anything more complicated than this. And certainly, we haven't done this. Like, we have not yet descended this picture from this algebraically closed field down to something like this. Um, so evidently, to generalize this picture, we need 
this tilting operation to work in more generality. And the stage on which you can do tilts uh, is the world of perfectoid spaces. So, well, how much of this can I really do? <laughs> Just say to do this properly, you need perfectoid spaces. This ring will be replaced with something like a perfectoid ring, which I'll define now. So perfectoid, well, I'll call the ring A. So it's a... Um, a kind of topological ring. Um, I'll give you three conditions. So it has to be a Tate ring. And so what this means is there exists some open subring. And the topology on your open subring. is generated by one element. And that element should be invertible in A. So if you've never seen this, this is sort of maybe confusing. There's an element in, that's a unit in A, but it lives in this smaller ring, and the smaller ring has a topology generated by that element. But the example to, I mean, the first example of this would just simply be A is QP, and this Ring of definition can just be ZP. And then your pi can just be P here, right? So QP is a ring. It's got an open subring. And the open subring has topology generated by P. And P is invertible in here. That's important. Um, but then the other rings that appear in rigid analytic geometry also satisfy this description. All right, so these are power series in T, which converge on the closed unit disk. And same here, but the coefficients now live in ZP. And once again, P is this pi. So P generates the topology here. In fact, this is just the completion of the polynomial ring with respect to the p-adic topology. So this is what I mean by a Tate ring, so this, this kind of ring. Well, neither of those is perfectoid, though. Um, I won't spend any time telling you what uniform is. Uh, and then three is the important bit. <laughs> so you can take for this element pi, some element uh, whose p power divides p. And this has to prop ha uh, have the property that, OK, so a upper 0. This means the bounded elements in a. Very often, it's the same as this ring of definition. Uh, And the piece power map is going to be an isomorphism on this. All right. So anything with the label of perfectoid satisfies some condition like this, where raising to the power of p is an isomorphism. Notice that if you have um, some element here, modulo pi to the p, it's got to have some pth root. But then it lives here again, and then it has another pth root, and then it has another pth root, and so forth. So such rings end up being basically never an Ethereum. They have just too many roots. <laughs> piece roots of things. You can often form compatible systems of piece roots. All right, so wait, I'm going to take this all the way up. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a second. So these rings are going to be the building blocks for perfectoid spaces.
Well, much as you build schemes from spectra of rings, you build attic spaces from attic spectra. Uh, I'm, I can't go into the entire formalism, but the notation is like this. You need a pair consisting of A, where A is such a ring, and then A plus is a ring of integral elements, so to speak. Um, but a perfectoid space is an attic space, which space which locally looks like this. Oh, uh, we have this notion of tilting for perfectoid rings, just as we had for the case of the field C. So the tilt of A is sequences of pth power compatible elements of A. And you can again give this the structure of a ring, even though a priori it's just a monoid. You can add elements in this in some consistent way. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you can globalize this. A perfectoid space now has a tilt. The result is that perfectoid spaces in whatever characteristic can be transported via tilting to perfectoid spaces in characteristic P. So the tilt lives over FP. And so this is a functor from all perfectoid spaces to just the ones in characteristic P. So in Peter's original paper, he discusses the fact that this preserves a lot of structure. Um, certainly, the analytic topology, so S is a topological space with some structure sheaf. So is S tilt. But in fact, the underlying topological spaces are just the same. They're homeomorphic. Uh, in fact, that homeomorphism preserves rational subsets. It's very nice. It also preserves the atal topology. Some other topologies. So this tilting basically keeps everything topologically the same. It just changes the structure sheaf. And so a lot of the theme in what I'm about to say is like, well, when you pass from S to its tilt, what have you forgotten? And the thing that you've forgotten is how to untilt. And untilting is key to answering the question from the beginning, like what is a map from something in characteristic P to spec QP? It's going to be an untilt. Um, all right. Let perf be the category of perfectoid spaces in characteristic P. And define. There have been many geometric objects that have appeared of various different flavors, and here's one more. <laughs> All right, so this is supposed to be the diamond spectrum of ZP, new concept. So it's going to be a functor from perfectoid spaces to sets. And this is going to try to reverse this tilting operation up here. So given a perfectoid space S in characteristic P, I can ask um, for all of the possible untilts. So if tilting is flat, then untilting should be sharp. So I want a pair consisting of a perfectoid space and an I, where I is an isomorphism from S to the tilt of S sharp. So such a thing would be an untilt. The untilt could live in characteristic 0 or characteristic P or both. It's just an untilt. An untilt. Tilting is a, you know, idempotent operation. Um, within this, I have this sub sheaf 
SPDQP, and that would be everything here, except I add the condition that the untilt really lives in characteristic zero. So P is going to be invertible on the untilt if I'm considering this sheaf SPDQP. So this object is going to play the role that we really wanted for spec ZP at the very beginning of this lecture series, which is that spaces of Stuckas should be fibered over multiple copies of this. So um, at least a priori, it makes sense to say SPDZP cross SPDZP. That's just the self product of this sheaf. By the way, I'm calling it a sheaf, but I did not mention what topology this is. It is the V topology. I'm not going to say a word about that because I have only seven minutes left. <laughs> okay. No, I don't. I have. Oh, I didn't start at nine. I'm still not going. <laughs> I'm still not going to say. <laughs> Maybe at the Q and A session I can try to explain. Well, then, no. If, since I have so much time, I'll just say that there is there is a topology on Perf. Oh, I shouldn't rush so much. Use the V topology on Perf. And this is uh, approximately an analog for the FPQC topology. On schemes. And this topology on schemes is very good for problems of descent. In particular, representable sheaves, re representable pre sheaves on the category of schemes are sheaves for this topology. And you can say the same for perfectoid spaces. So each perfectoid space gives you a functor from perf to sets, just by the yoneta embedding. And you get a pre-sheaf a priori, but in fact it's going to be a sheaf for this topology. It's a very fine topology. It's very useful. So that's the topology we work in. Um, this SPDQP is an example of what Schulze has named a, oh, I should say something. Oh, and what I've written? Ah, right. Oh, what do I do? S2. It's what? It's contravariant. Oh, I should, oh, oh, well, I'm sorry. Fair. Well, yeah, as we, yeah, as you would expect. Yeah, as we expect. Okay. Yeah, 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 okay. But even still, it's unclear why this is a function. <laughs> sorry, you're right, you're right. I, I made a mistake by not putting this. But you need some lemma that, well, you need a theorem from Peter's original work on perfectoid spaces that once you have a, I'll just write it this way. If you have a morphism of perfectoid spaces and you've untilted one of them, then there's this kind of lift of x to x sharp. I'll just write it this way. <laughs> if you've untilted a base perfectoid space and then you have anything at all living over x over, over it, if it's perfectoid, it automatically lifts in some canonical way. So in so doing, whenever you have a map from x to y, you have a map from untilts of y to untilts of x. And so that's why you get this contravariant functor out of the category of perfectoid spaces. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to give a formal definition of diamond, but I will indicate that it is something like an algebraic space in the world of schemes. Oh, right. 
Uh, right, the question was, how do you detect whether S sharp lives over QP? So it's structure sheaf. So I mean, it's, a, it's an attic space. And so by this, I really just mean there's a morphism from this to SPD QP. Not SPA QP, excuse me. And so in the category of attic spaces, this makes sense. And so another way of saying this is that every, the structure sheaf is a sheaf of QP vector spaces. Okay. Uh, by diamond, okay. So there's going to be a, um, how do you con even construct this thing? Ah, where, where am I? Uh, so I can put an extension field of QP here and define a very similar functor. It would be untilts that live over the extension field. And so the extension field I want is the field you get by adjoining all p power roots of unity to QP and completing. And the result is a perfectoid field when I do that. There is an action of Galois on this. The Galois group is ZP cross. So I can take this and mod out by the action of the constant sheaf ZP cross on this. Okay. Uh, but now this is actually a perfectoid field. So it makes sense to tilt it. So I'm going to put a little tilt symbol right there. And the idea behind the definition of diamond is that a diamond is a quotient of a perfectoid space, of which this is an example, by a pro et al equivalence relation. So what we have here is a free action of a group, which is a, well, in this case, it's just a pro finite group. So such quotients exist in this category of diamonds. Yeah, OK. So in this, because this is actually representable, it's legal for me to cross out the D and put an A. That's correct. So I mean, you could put, uh, um, like, <laughs> I mean, you, you could have put a perfectoid space playing the role here and then saying, I want all untilts where the untilt lives over that base that you chose. And then you just get the representable sheaf represented by that perfectoid space. So that's what happened here. Um, let me make this even a little more explicit. So well, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, right. But actually, it doesn't matter because of this, because of this equivalence. I mean, if I have an untilt over the, <laughs> if I have a morphism to the tilt, then I auto automatically get an untilt. <laughs> no, it's very confusing. Um, what are the points of this sheaf over an algebraically closed field? So let's say change of perspective now. C lives over FP in this board. Um, so I could have written here SPDQP evaluated at C, but I prefer to write it this way because I want to think of like SPDQP as an object of its own right, like a geometric object. So morphisms from C to this correspond exactly to untilts of C to characteristic zero. And according to this isomorphism, to get one, what I do is consider all possible maps from the tilt of the cyclotomic field into C and mod out by a ZP cross acting as a Galois group on this field. Yeah. After all, if I want an untilt of C, um, once I have a map from QP cyclotomic tilt to C, then by this principle I said over there, untilting this base automatically untilts this. All right, so how do I write down such a map? Well, I have to say where a system of roots of unity goes. So in fact, I can just display this as, yeah, once again, this group, this is, Banach Komez space is going to appear. Yeah. Oh, what happened here? All right, if I have an element well, 
such a map tells me where all roots of unity go. And so I can just say, what, so what is this, the, the isomorphism from here to here? Well, it's telling me where this field contains an element epsilon. Sorry, no brackets required. Epsilon has to go somewhere. That somewhere has to be close to 1, it turns out. And wherever it goes is where you send this epsilon. Letters, what? The left side of the equality. The left side of what? The equality. Oh, you want to put some letters in front of the ah, Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Letters. <laughs> there you go. I want to give you the of letters. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> All right. All right, wonderful. OK. So given all of this, it now makes sense So I mean, thinking about this object SPDZP this way allows you to define arbitrary products of this object in a way that makes sense. And so this is going to be key to defining what a mixed characteristic local Stuka is. OK, where is next? Uh, up there. Well, if you have a, just products exist in the category of sheaves, so you just take the product, you know. And this product evaluated on a base S is just pairs of, pairs of untilts of it. That's it. <clears throat> all right. Okay, part three, local Stuka space is very good, all right. So, um, yeah, I need to talk about the relative curve. All right, so we've had kind of the absolute curve living over some algebraically closed field, and now we want this to move in families. So I'll tell you how to do this on an affinoid perfectoid. So this ring R here is going to be a perfectoid ring. Uh, it should just be in characteristic P. Well, it isn't so hard to come up with the formula. So you need to take this ring of integral elements. That's a perfect ring of characteristic P. Put it into bit vectors and then Remove the locus where either P or a pseudo uniformizer of R is equal to zero. And the result of this is that you get this family of Farg Fontan curves. Like for each geometric point of S, you get a Farg Fontan curve of the sort we've been talking about. But now this runs in families. And so it's families that are parametrized by S, but unlike how the notation suggests, there's certainly no map to S. So this is sort of like a warning. <laughs> There's no map from this thing to S. Um, instead, this thing, in a sense, parametrizes untilts. Well, kind of. Actually, certain kinds of divisors on this curve classify untilts. Oh, and I should definitely say that there is a Frobenius automorphism acting on this. So that you can then define. Um, the x version of the curve to be the quotient. Mm -hmm. 
And what I just said was that there exists a bijection On the one hand, you have untilts, like represented over there. On the other hand, um, well, as in the absolute case, these would just correspond to points on the curve. But in this relative case, you have a family of curves parameterized by s. And so the object we're looking for is a divisor on the curve a divisor of degree one. There's certain kinds of Cartier divisors. Mm -hmm. So I'll write it as, so I mean if an untilt is represented by S sharp, then I want this to be an effective divisor of degree one, although I won't exactly explain what that means right now. Um, the divisor, I've labeled it by S sharp, but the underlying attic space of it really just is S sharp. So <laughs> this is analogous in the absolute case. We had this point xc, which lived in the curve associated to c tilt. We have this point xc. But now in families, we don't just have one point. We have a whole divisor. All right. So we're building up to this now. We've constructed the farc fontaine curve in a relative sense, like in families. And so now a local Stuka should be some data which lives on this curve xffs it should be like a modification of vector bundles on that curve where one of the vector bundles is trivial. Yes. Uh, in fact, you've anticipated what I was going to write. Well, it is just locally defined by the vanishing of one element of the structure sheaf. Um, the idea being that I mean, I had some mm, I, I quoted some theorem before about the kernel of a map like this, except I was using C here. No, C tilt here and just C here. But there's still a map that I would, might call theta. And this D S sharp is like the kernel of theta, although you have to translate it into this, this setting. It's still locally generated by one element. So that's why I'm calling it a Cartier divisor. Um, So, oh, yeah, right. All right, so philosophically, what's going on? We want to define Stuckas, blah, blah, blah. This product makes sense because this is just a product of one sheaf on perf by a representable sheaf on perf. What I want to get across to you is somehow that this relative curve, like, is this product. Well, it's not literally, but the functor that it defines on the category perf, and this is denoted by diamond, then literally is this. So there's some strong <laughs> reason why you should consider this y to be this product. So that's one thing. Um, a map from S to SPDQP is an untilt. We already said this. And then finally, since we have this divisor to work with now, that divisor should be, as someone, as you said, the, the graph of this map. So 
So if I call this x, the graph of x should just be this divisor. So this curve yff is like an avatar for this product. This untilt is an avatar for a map from s to qp. And this divisor is an avatar for the graph of x. So now everything is in place to define our Stukas. <laughs> so I'm just going to discuss the case of GLN. Okay. And we can define uh, the ZP Stukas that we want. So I need to fix some data. This n will be like rank n stuckers. And I also want to fix an isocrystal. And I want to specify which one it is by saying I want this over, well, OK. Uh, yeah, I mean, before I had k here, but I actually want, for applications, I want this k to be this qp brevo. What does that mean? That's vit vectors of fp bar invert p. And it's playing the role of this field capital K we had before. So this specifies an isocrystal. And what I do is I define Um, some objects in the category of sheaves on perf. And this object is going to just be fibered over SPD. Keep you brave. What does it do? So the values that this sheaf takes on a perfectoid space, I want the perfectoid space to live over an algebraically closed field in characteristic p. All right. I didn't have to do it, but it works out better this way. add one bit of notation. I'm just going to skip directly to where I define the Stukas with infinite level structure. That definition is actually easier for me. All right, so this will classify some data. And just as the original definition of Drinfeld Stukas, it will be legs, a vector bundle, and then a map between vector bundles. So I need three pieces of data. One of them is going to be a leg. So that's going to be a map from S to SPD, QP Breva. And that's the same thing as an untilt, S sharp, which lives over this field. So S lives in characteristic P, but specifying a leg is exactly the same as specifying an untilt. The second piece of data would be a vector bundle. Well, I already have the vector bundle. It's going to be, well, the B you know it gives me an EB, which is a vector bundle of rank N on X, living over any base you like, including this base S. So since I've already specified what the vector bundle is, I can then move on to just the map. And the map's going to be F from a trivial vector bundle of rank n to this one. 
EB, living over X Fark Fontaine F. This is a dotted arrow. I mean for this to be an isomorphism. away from ds sharp. And then at ds sharp, it should be meromorphic and bounded by mu. Ooh, all right. Um, wow. Uh, I said this was at infinite level. If I didn't do that, well, the, the thing is, this, this Stucke space as I've defined it has an action of the group of automorphisms of this vector bundle. And that group of automorphisms, as I mentioned before, was GLNQP. So if I write down again, Stucke's GLN B mu infinity. There's an action of the group GLNQP. I'm going to underline it just to mean that this, it, it's really acting in the, what, as a constant group scheme. Sorry, as a constant sheaf of groups on perf. So everything lives in perf. Everything is a sheaf on perf, including this group. Um, I could recover finite level spaces of Stuckas by choosing my favorite compact open subgroup H. And then I could quotient this out to get something that lives at finite level. That's not the only, oh yes. What's that? Where? On your automorphism? Yes. Yeah, do you want QP or this QP I want QP, so. Great. <laughs> right. So I mentioned that the automorphism group of O x to the n really is just GLN QP. And if I do this in a sense of sheaves on perf, then in, this, is, this is really true. It is not brave. Yeah. I mean, think about it. They have to commute with Frobenius. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> OK. I mean, you can deduce this from. The theorem I quoted before about the automorphisms of a basic vector bundle corresponding to the automorphisms of just the isocrystal. But this would be the trivial isocrystal, and you, the, the isomorphisms are just QP. They're not QP Brieva, which is good because we're interested in the representation theory of this group for Langlands. Yeah. There is another group acting here. It is the automorphism group of whatever this vector bundle EB is. In the cohomology of this, you might get an interesting relation between the representation theories of these two groups. That is all leading to something interesting called the Kotwitz conjecture for this. Maybe I can explain a little bit during the Q&A session, but for now, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, what would happen if you tried to make a more direct analogy to Stuckas? And that's what I've been trying to do. But um, we, what you're not seeing here is Frobenius pullback, right? But that was the point of this theorem I quoted by Farg earlier, which says that um, the Stuckas that arise via Frobenius pullback, and those were the Broig, Kiss, and Farg modules, are actually in equivalence with structures that look like this. It was just easier for me to take this formulation of Stuckas and make it relative. So that's it. So you can also make the other one relative. But you can also make the other one relative. So you could take the corresponding a nth in families and also just consider, I mean, is there a? We still have to invert time Yeah, so I mean, it, naively you would do a nth. I mean, I could say a nth of s, I suppose. I mean, 
what's wrong with considering Stuka's as modules over this with some don't invert key. Don't invert key. Oh. Something like that. Something like that. Would that actually recover the, the right definition? Yes. yes. So you can do it. <laughs> but I wanted to do it this way to prepare you for what's happening later this week. So question. Uh, see? So, oh. so, so there is a divider. So can you define like an I bundle, uh, uh, canonical I bundle for example, this uh, divider and then do some twist of an I bundle to give it? Can you give, uh, oh, so the divisor corresponds to a line bundle. Yes. And yes, that's correct. I mean, but that line bundle is just O of 1. I mean, it's isomorphic to O of 1. So already we got a sense of this when I define this element T. In a way, you can think of, so this T has a simple pole, uh, sorry, no, a simple 0. at xc. So if you like, uh, and no other zeros, it's an isomorphism everywhere else. So if you like, this t is really an isomorphism between the line bundle coming from the divisor, really just a point xc, to O of 1. But every divisor would be the same. What? The Picard group is trivial, every divisor would be the same. The Picard group is not trivial, because O of 1 is not the same as O, but uh, Oh, he's not saying zero, you're saying z. And then it's true. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, to talk about this val with mu, do you need some notion of affine Grassmannian? Right. To talk about mu, do you need a notion of affine Grassmannian? And you do. The way to set this up correctly is to first define the affine Grassmannian, see that you have a map from Stuckers to it, and then Stuckers bounded by mu would be the pre image of the Grassmannian bounded by mu under that map. Hi. What's the relationship between this choice of B and GLN QP breve and the Totwood set? Like if I have a B and a B prime, I have the same class of Totwood set. Ah, right. If you have B and B prime and they're equivalent in the Kotwitz set, then there would be isomorphism between the Stuka spaces. I mean, B only appears through EB. And if B and B prime are the same in the Kotwitz set, then E, B, and E prime are isomorphic. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. The Stuka space is a sheaf on perf. That's right. All of these objects are. So. Is there a case when it is uh, an actual uh, adding space? Yes. Oh, you're asking a very good question. So. Is there a case where the Stuka space is not just some abstract sheaf on perf, but rather it's representable? And the answer is yes. It happens when mu is a minuscule co-character. And this happens in general. So if g, you could write down a Stuka space like this. Well, whatever g you want, whatever b you want, and whatever mu you want. If this mu has this property of being minuscule, and then this is going to be representable by not just an attic space, but actually a rigid analytics variety. So much more down to earth. Otherwise, it's a diamond. Okay, thank you. So perhaps we can keep the other question for the Q&A session. Sure. So we'll uh, uh, break. Uh, so we will uh, resume at uh, 11.05. So can uh, thank again, Mr. Okay.